Hello, UConn. My name is Andy McGraw. I'm a music professor here at the University of Richmond, coming to you from our Gamelan studio. I wanted to set up the following video performance for you a bit. This performance includes traditional and contemporary kronchong, Indonesian string band music, excerpts from Balinese Wayang Kulit Shadow Theater, accompanied by Gamelan, and a new collaboration about the links created between Virginia and Indonesia by the tobacco industry. I encourage you to read through the supplemental reading I've prepared and linked in the YouTube description. This packet includes a short introduction to the Rumput Ensemble and to Kronchong, a brief program, and academic articles on the tobacco industry. As you know, this video was shot as the coronavirus epidemic began to have substantial impacts on life in America. The project was intended to be presented by, live by the full ensemble at universities following a string of smaller public venue performances. Prior to the video shoot itself, two of the members were showing associated symptoms, they're okay now, and had to digitally add their parts from home, quarantine. So, for instance, you're going to hear a flautist that you can't see. Finally, we want to thank Yukon and especially Matthew Isaac Cohen for agreeing to fund this performance considering these extraordinary circumstances. We all know that watching a video just isn't the same as having the opportunity to experience it live and ask questions of the performers afterward. But the funds we're able to raise for Gusti are even more important now. If we think the pandemic is going to be bad in the US, it's going to be worse in Indonesia, given its healthcare system. And these performances, these funds from these performances will help him weather inevitable changes. Thank you, enjoy the show, and feel free to, feel free to reach out to me at amcgraw, A-M-C-G-R-A-W, at richmond.edu if you have any questions. Thanks.
We're from Richmond, Virginia, an historical center for the tobacco industry, home to Altria, previously Philip Morris, and R.J. Reynolds. It's where the iconic Lucky Strike brand was made for years. Today, most of the money for the arts in our city can be traced to that industry. Because we work with Indonesian arts and artists and have spent a lot of time in Indonesia, probably over eight years collectively, we have been thinking a lot recently about the rapid rise of tobacco in that country and how it might be connected to Virginia. We've sometimes wondered if the art scene we enjoy in Richmond is somehow built upon the suffering of our friends and teachers in places like Indonesia. This performance is essentially a research project and artistic response to the links that have been created between opposite ends of the world, Virginia and Indonesia, through the exploitation of engineered addiction. When we think about tobacco and cigarettes in America or Indonesia, we are thinking about the distribution of wealth, power, control, and health. Tobacco was cultivated as a medicinal and sacred plant in the Americas since at least 1000 BC. John Rolfe in Jamestown was the first colonist to grow tobacco, learning the complex art from the local Powhatan. In 1614, the first shipment was sent to England. Merchants, called the Tobacco Lords, grew wealthy from the early trade of tobacco to Europe. Their greed established a vicious cycle of exploitation and profit. Tobacco farming was labor intensive. Early profits on tobacco paid for the purchase of indentured servants and then African slaves beginning in 1619. The tobacco economy in the colonies gave rise to the triangular trade to fulfill European demand for tobacco. Sugar, cotton, and tobacco were traded to the British Isles, which sent manufactured goods and textiles to Africa, where slaves were captured, sold, and brought through the Middle Passage to the colonies to work in tobacco and cotton plantations.
By 1700, tobacco was a major industry and habit in Europe and its colonies in Asia. Europeans began to use their colonies as cheap places to produce tobacco, including the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, an archipelago of 17,000 islands located north of Australia. In the 19th century, the Dutch introduced smoking to the Dutch East Indies and established tobacco plantations in Java. The Javanese blend called kretek, or clove cigarettes, was invented in the mid 19th century. Kretek contained much higher tar and nicotine concentrations, four times more than Marlboro. When Kretek were invented, smoking was understood as something new, sophisticated, and foreign, a way to demonstrate status in a colonial society. Kronchong music emerged from the confluence of European and local musics, was the so sonic equivalent of Kretek. The two became culturally linked, such that for many Indonesians, the distinctive sound of kronchong evokes the sm aroma of closed cigarettes. Here is a tune that would have been performed in Java when kretet were invented. Kronchong Moretsko evokes colonial era, era Batavia, now Jakarta, for many Indonesians. Around the turn of the 19th century, the prestige associated with tobacco had worked its way even into Balinese Hindu temple ceremonies. The elaborate offerings, bandan, 
made for the island's ubiquitous temples, began to include cigarettes and loose tobacco as offerings to gods and to appease the voracious appetites of demons. The Balinese have long incorporated signs of foreign prestige in their offerings, including old Chinese and colonial coins, and today, mints and soda and beer bottles. The tobacco grown by the local Native Americans of Virginia was considered too strong for pipe smoking. It was mostly chewed. But just before the Civil War, a new strain called Brightleaf Tobacco was grown by Lewis Ginter in Richmond. Because this happened around the time of the California Gold Rush, East Coast farmers called Brightleaf, which turned a warm yellow after being cured, Eastern Gold. This is what the brand name Lucky Strike referred to because growing bright leaf was like hitting a gold seam. White overseers segregated their workers to control the complex production process associated with bright leaf. This first meant keeping slaves in the fields or restricted permanently to specific tasks. After the Civil War, Jim Crow was the real force behind the structure of the industry. The KKK emerged at this time in the area of brightly production alongside a parallel sharecropping system intended to keep African Americans from directly owning or controlling the land on which bright leaf was grown. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, small-scale tobacco farmers found themselves pitted against large, internationalizing and consolidating tobacco traders and producers. This was controlled through James B. Duke's monopoly, the Tobacco Trust. Duke later went on to form Duke University. Prices were manipulated by the companies to keep farmers in permanent debt. When Duke began investing in cigarettes in the early 20th century, they accounted for only 2% of American tobacco products. In America at this time, cigarettes were viewed as a decidedly foreign object associated with Europeans and low-class immigrants. The tobacco companies also faced pushback from a surprisingly diverse collection of social activists, Christian moral reformers, efficiency evangelists, health advocates, suffragists, nativists, and eugenicists. While we're more familiar with the prohibition on alcohol, between 1830 and 1910, 15 states prohibited cigarettes. Some activists expressed fears about how cigarettes would blur the lines between the sexes. Men who smoked were described as effeminate, while women who did received special scorn. They risked the premature degeneration of the sex glands, according to homeopath physician turned serial magnate John Harvey Kellogg. The First World War changed the history of the cigarette. In coordination with the tobacco industry, the federal government included cigarettes in soldiers' rations. Mm. Industry ad executives created wartime songs like, Don't Be a Slacker, Send Some Tobacco, and Don't Forget the Smoke. This effort successfully replaced earlier negative associations with cigarettes with notions of sacrifice, patriotism, and masculinity. One, two, three. 
positive images of cigarettes were amplified by Hollywood and early product placement. While in 1915, the U.S. produced about 18 billion cigarettes, by 1930, this increased to 124 billion. Companies poured their profits into sophisticated advertising and product research. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes not. Early television and radio advertising appealed shamelessly to children or to sexual innuendo or sometimes both as in the case of this Muriel cigar jingle from around 1950, from an animated TV ad featuring a cigar performing a striptease. Anti-tobacco sentiment in the U.S. has often figured smoking as an individual failure of judgment at will. By a two-to-one margin, smokers and non-smokers alike blame smokers rather than the tobacco companies for smoking-related diseases. But this overlooks just how insidious and sophisticated tobacco production and advertising have been. And ever since the mass production of sheet music, songs and jingles have been closely tied to tobacco. Light up the light smoke of Lucky Strike The right smoke, the light smoke, the Lucky Strike All the taste that you like Light up a Lucky Strike A network news investigation in 1994 showed that cigarette companies had spiked their product with additional nicotine and other cancer-causing substances. The scale of the health effects, first indicated by the studies published decades earlier, started to become obvious. This led to the string of lawsuits against Big Tobacco, culminating in the Master Settlement Agreement in 1998. The major companies agreed to end advertising to youth. The agreement required the companies to pay billions to the states for 25 years until 2023. In return, the companies received immunity from future class action lawsuits. But states depended on the settlement for revenues, which were largely used to balance state budgets. Recognizing this, a J.R. Reynolds vice president said in 2003, there's no doubt that the largest financial stakeholder in the industry is our state governments. started feeling the pressures of anti-tobacco campaigns and regulation following the master settlement agreement, many of them turned to less regulated Asian markets. In Richmond, Philip Morris rebranded as Altria in 2003 and spun off Philip Morris International, placing its headquarters in Switzerland. Altria now owns Juul and several cannabinoid companies. Today, 90% of tobacco is grown overseas. China produces seven times the amount of tobacco as the U.S. 
It is more profitable than ever, even while farmers' shares of profits have dwindled. Philip Morris International had annual net revenue of $30 billion in 2018. Altria's was $26 billion. today, but two of the largest are owned by British and American firms. By far the largest company, Samporna, was bought by Philip Morris International in 2010. These companies regularly market to children through television and public advertisements. They sponsor sporting and music events, and their ad campaigns like Samporna's Never Quit campaign plaster Indonesian public spaces. These are exactly the tactics that were outlawed in the United States through the Master Settlement Agreement. Today, Indonesia is the third largest cigarette market in the world. It is also the fastest growing market, with over 100 million smokers. 70% of Indonesian men smoke, and today 30% of Indonesian children reportedly smoke a cigarette before the age of 10. There is no minimum age for buying cigarettes in Indonesia, and no public bans on smoking in Indonesia. More than 5% of national revenue comes from the tobacco industry, second only to oil. The Indonesian tobacco industry is heavily dependent on child labor. Few workers are given proper gear, and they can suffer acute nicotine poisoning. As in the United States, large multinational corporations manipulate prices to keep farmers in debt. Smoking is associated with 400,000 deaths in Indonesia every year. Many of the Indonesian musicians we have worked with suffer from tobacco-related health problems. We are especially worried for them now, as smoking is highly correlated with mortality from COVID-19. Tobacco means jobs. Jobs. Ah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Job. I need a job. Tobacco means livelihoods. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm. Tobacco means life. 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 Mm. life. Protect our tobacco premise. For okay. Yeah. 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 Smoke releases stress and depression. I'm stressed. Mm. I need oh. Are you a smoker? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you are lucky and happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> happy, happy, happy. Yeah. Yeah. Happy, happy, happy. Yeah. happy, happy, happy. cigarettes, okay? Yeah. Uh, Your health is much more valuable. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, protect our children from tobacco. Yes, protect the children. Mm. No. Are you a smoker? Yeah. yeah. yeah uh. If so, 
You are only bringing up your money, your body, and your future. Whoa! Wait, 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 wait! Sacrificing everyone's health with your smoking, uh, all for money. Uh, you have no morals, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it is the rights of business to make a profit. So wow, okay. it yeah. has always been that way. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. You don't even want to know the effects yeah. of tobacco. Yeah, kind of you are sacrificing a generation, you know. Uh, and I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Hey, hey you should care. Yeah. Tobacco supports 9 million farmers and gives work to many more. We support artists, athletes, and give money to the government. What do you do? Bullshit! We see through your conspiracy, no moral. Go enjoy your money, and I will give you. Huh? The morning prize, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Morning prize. <laughs> 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 There is widespread misinformation in Indonesia about the health impacts of smoking. Many believe that closed cigarettes are medicinal, that they can cure asthma. And many think that anti-tobacco campaigns are just a neo-colonial ploy to undermine poor Javanese tobacco farmers. Indonesians have good historical reasons for being suspicious of apparently benevolent Western advice. Indonesian anti-tobacco protesters explicitly frame the current situation as colonial exploitation. Many more people in Indonesia and America die every year from tobacco-related diseases than murder, suicides, alcohol, automobile accidents, and AIDS combined. But this is hard to see through what Allen Ginsberg called the narcotic tobacco haze of capitalism.
Our closing piece is by the Indonesian composer Iwayan Sadra. According to Pak Sadra, with whom I studied and performed, this piece was an abstract critique of corruption in the Indonesian government. He died in 2010 of lung cancer related to his smoking habit. On his deathbed, he implored the young musicians he worked with to stop smoking. Most of them still do. Thank you. 